Dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon from me as well. My name is uh, Alexander Kotsev. Uh, I work for the Joint Research Center of the European Commission and I have the privilege to say a few words uh, and to open the interesting uh, workshop uh, that is ahead of us. Uh, let me give you uh, uh, a little bit of a context uh, together. Today we are discussing the data ecosystems for geospatial uh, data um, study uh, that is being implemented uh, within the context of the Elise ISA Square action. The project started in January uh, 2020. It is performed by the Luxembourg Institute uh, of Science and Technology. List, uh, but uh, we have been working very close together with the colleagues from List from the very beginning. What is the objective? The objective of the study is to identify and analyze a set of successful data ecosystems uh, and to learn from those ecosystems, to come up with actionable recommendations that can help uh, us in the transition from the uh, spatial data infrastructure structures uh, thinking that we uh, all know very well and to uh, align uh, what we have in spatial data infrastructures uh, uh, to uh, within the context of the newly launched European uh, strategy for data. So really uh, we approached uh, the problem of this transition through looking into existing uh, uh, ecosystems uh, for things that work with didn't want to invent everything ourselves. And today I have the pleasure that uh, uh, to, to mention that we have come a long way after many iterations, after a very uh, sophisticated, uh, scientifically sound process that will be presented a little bit later. We have now uh, the opportunity to share the study results and we look forward to a lively debate uh, and uh, your, your feedback. So thanks a lot uh, uh, to all uh, the colleagues who joined. Thanks a lot uh, also to our distinguished panelists who will be introduced a little bit later. A few words before we dive into the details about the ELISE action. ELISE uh, is one of the 54 uh, different actions uh, that are put in place by the ISA squared program with the overall objective of improving interoperability. So all the, the uh, ISA squared actions uh, approach the problem of uh, interoperability from a different angle. And ELISE is the action, it is actually unique uh, uh, because of the fact that it is focusing explicitly on interoperability of location data. So the location that they mention is the leading one. And what ELISE does is it looks at uh, different aspects related to cross-border, but also cross-domain interoperability solutions with the idea to support uh, e-government activities, uh, to support uh, public administrations, but also to improve the interrelation between the public sector, businesses and uh, citizens. That said, uh, uh, I would like now to um, uh, give the floor um, to um, uh, Slim and the colleagues from the Luxembourg Institute for Science and Technology so to introduce the study. So please, colleagues. Good afternoon. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Thank you all for joining. My name is Slim Turkey, and I am happy to run the study with my colleagues Sébastien Martin and Finn Gauthier. Three of us are from the Luxembourg Institute of Science of Technology. It's a research and technology organization addressing digital innovation, environment, and materials in innovation. Our main topic of research in our team is the open data release and the use and the data ecosystems. Uh, today and during this session, we will start by presenting the study approach. Then we will have a panel representing the diversity of the data ecosystem stakeholders to discuss the recommendation followed by a summary focusing on the sites for the evolution of, uh, of uh, spatial data infrastructure, SDIs. The floor then will be open for the interactive sessions. Let's start with the approach. So the approach was empirical by principle and relied on the identification and analysis of existing data ecosystems. A subset of them, five, were then selected for in-depth analysis and all the selected and not selected data ecosystem analyzed contributed to the development of the recommendation presented today. 
So the five ecosystem selected are the first one is the local data uh, local data ecosystem is illustrated by the case of Rennes Metropole and its uh, initiative called Rudy uh, Rennes Urban Data Interface. So Rennes is uh, implemented since 2016 a collab collaborative and partnership based uh, local data strategy targeting an inclusive, inclusive and sustainable governance model for the local ecosystem and adopting the quadriplegic model. REN is also experimenting the concept of the city as trusted third party, allowing citizens to take back control over their personal data. The second ecosystem is the geospatial data marketplace and is illustrated by App42. App42 is a marketplace and developer platform providing access to both data and analytics form from different uh, sources. Op42 is also offering a value distribution model that con is contributing to changing the way geospatial data is accessed and analyzed. The third ecosystem addresses tracking technologies for supply chain and is illustrated by Spire. Spire builds and manages a constellation of nano satellites, collecting and distributing Earth observation data, maritime data using IIS messages, aviation data using ADSB data, and weather data using radio occultation. Smart agriculture is illustrated by API Agro. API Agro is a business to business data exchange platform operated by AgData Hub and a company of up to 30 partners representing the agriculture sector from private companies and public sector bodies as uh, like chambers of agriculture, technical agriculture institutes. It provides a functional technical, commercial and legal framework for data exchange between the various stakeholders. Least and not, last and not least, the disaster management ecosystem is illustrated through two use cases. First, the, the Brussels Emergency Services Data Sharing Platform and the Danish Common Data on topography, climate, and water project preparing the country for climate change scenarios. By integrating the two use cases, we were able to, uh, we, we cover the emergency management phases from mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And also, we highlight the importance of considering at the same time the two time dimension, real time, historical, and simulation. So, to analyze this ecosystem, we defined a modular analysis framework built of three layers. The first one is the ecosystem summary, giving an overall representation of the ecosystem key aspects. The second is ecosystem dynamic, uh, value dynamics, and the third is ecosystem data flows. The disk research was completed by interviews with experts and stakeholders. For the second layer, so the deco, uh, system value dynamics, it illustrates the resources exchanged between the stakeholders and their value. For example, in the case shown uh, in, in the slide, uh, it's the case of REN. It helps to understand the structure of the ecosystem, who are the uh, stakeholders engaged, how they are organized, how they, uh, how they col uh, collaborate between them themselves, and what are the values exchanges. And it also helped us to trace in green on the schema, the, uh, the green arrows, the impact of uh, uh, part of the project review called Call for Project, which uh, and the impact of this initiative on the dynamization of the ecosystem. So these calls are open to all the community and offer uh, facilitated access to data, to stakeholders, coaching, and funding. Then the ecosystem data flows represent the ecosystem from the perspective of data. And uh, these uh, flows are a good proxies to evaluate the maturity, maturity and health of the ecosystem. In the example here, we see uh, it's an example from App42, the geospatial data marketplace example, when we can see data uh, from uh, Sentinel or uh, uh, Pleiades and Copernicus in general data are combined with commercial data to be exposed on the data marketplace. These data are available for, uh, for distribution to and for media is like the company Live EO that we participate uh, in the panel also. And that allow that is the access to of Live EO to these to uh, specific data sets and also to processing blocks 
allowing uh, the company to offer uh, data inf uh, infrastructure uh, management services to the Deutsche Bank. This activity also, in return, could generate new services that could be made available on the, plat on the platform. This is what I have to say about the method and the, and the framework. I give the floor to Prune uh, for the panel. So, I'm very pleased to moderate this panel today and very thankful for the participation of our panelists. So, dear panelists, let me introduce you and please turn your cam on so everybody can see you. So, there is a woman first, Marion Glacon, which is Smart City and Innovation Director at Fred Metropole. There is also uh, Simon Saint Georges, which is, is the Ruby, Rudy, let's say, project manager at Red Metropole. We also have uh, Sean Weed, which is the CEO at Up42. Daniel Zeidel, which is the co-founder of Liveio, but also uh, Dan Isaac, the business development executive at Fire. Theopol Asbrook, which is digital expert in agriculture in Ad Data Hub. And to finish, Rink Crank, public policy specialist at the National Geographic Institute of Belgium. So, in order to, uh, let's say, give a clear picture of the recommendation, we decided to divide them in category. And so, we will start with the first category which is uh, governance. So uh, let's say that the government aims to arrange all the interaction and exchanging within the ecosystem. And the orchestration role is crucial in the ecosystem thinking. But we can always wonder if the choice of an orchestrator is obvious or forever or that kind of question. So I would like to ask Sean from Up42 for a first question. Could you please explain us how you reached the position of orchestrator in uh, your data and more marketplace? So if you can answer that, please. Sure, of course. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me, Slim and Prudent. Okay, so um, you know, Up42 was created because uh, Airbus basically recognized the need in the market for a, a platform that was able to get access to a wide range of open data and commercial data, as well as provide the easy access to algorithms and, and infrastructure. Uh, and the reason that, uh, that this is such an important aspect of, of opening up our industry is that right now there's still so many technical and commercial barriers in place that is stopping the, the, the longer term and broader adoption of Earth observ observation data and analytics. So as we started building out this platform and reaching out to industry, uh, industry experts, reaching out to data owners or data providers, reaching out to people who are building algorithms, we started to find out more and more about what such a marketplace would look like. Um, what became very clear at some point was that it, although we, we aspire to be, uh, and, and we are an open marketplace and and neutral across all players, there is still a role for us to play in terms of making sure that, that at least um, there's, a, there's a more or less a, a fair and transparent playing ground for everyone. Uh, so that involves a couple of different things, it involves making sure that everyone has got the right level of feedback about what's happening on the platform, what kind of, uh, what kind of use cases our customers are interested in, what kind of traction we're seeing. Um, and this is about us you know, helping to match the, the, the usage, the, the supply, uh, or rather the demand um, from the customer side with the supply on, on, on our partner side. Um, one thing that we need to be careful of though is that you know, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily um, describe ourselves as, uh, as, as, as governing the, the ecosystem, uh, more like a nexus point where it's all coming together. And the important thing is, is that for our partners, and this is really critical, is that we're not governing anything uh, with, with, as it pertains to the price of our partners' products or their terms and conditions, et cetera. It's important that our partners um, still maintain ownership of their IP and, and of, their, of their products. 
All right. Thanks a lot. Um, and you are highlighting a point that we call the role of orchestrator because it's not to govern, it's just to orchestrate all the action without governing, let's say. So uh, I would have the same question for my own, but in the particular focus of a local ecosystem, let's say a local public ecosystem. Could you please illustrate the role of the orchestrator uh, of a smart city, please, Marion? Oh, yes. Thank you very much for inviting us at this uh, round table. Um, well, as, um, as a local public actor, we have a lot of different types of roles, which are, let's say, traditional. We have interna internal management, public procurement. We can enact rules and we can also build partnerships. For the local data ecosystem, I think we have to mix all, uh, the, all those types of tools with a particular difficulty is that there is no official competence or role which is defined by a legal frame. And there is a um, sort of a competition in this field with a multiplicity of initiatives. I don't say, I don't mean competition as a, a war between different actors but more uh, this multiplicity of initiatives, we, everybody thinks that he's uh, uh, well entitled to lead an initiative in the field of uh, uh, bettering the management of data and uh, in, in his own field, whereas uh, a, a thematical field or a local field. And um, in what regards the, the action of a public actor as we, we are, uh, Rennes Metropole is the city and 42 cities around the, the mother city Rennes. And this, um, this role of orchestration is made of leadership on programs and projects. We propose some, some programs. Uh, for instance, this is what we initiated in 2010 with the open data program, which involved uh, at the time uh, also some partners of the territory and not only the, the public actor itself, for instance, uh, in the field of culture. Um, but we did it again, let me have this expression. We did it again uh, in 2016 with the initiation of a, a local public service for data. And uh, this local public service for data initiated in 2016 um, led to, to the proposition of a, a platform, a local platform for data sharing named Rudy. And this is this leadership is the first thing that we can we can design as a tool of the public actor. But the second one is to really to, to build partnership and to build them in the in the long term. And this is what is more difficult and more challenging maybe, because uh, we don't have the, the competence. We can't uh, just uh, uh, lay on a competence which would be, uh, okay, the, the public local actor is uh, entitled uh, for leading a data sharing policy on its territory. This is not the case. So we have to invent and we have to be very subtle in the way we invent this policy. Um, and, and maybe um, just to, to end on this first question, maybe uh, I think that um, we, we work on the idea that this public policy has very, a lot of, uh, of, uh, um, of people, of uh, type of institutions which have to intervene and to, to be active in this part. But I think that the role of the public actor will remain important after the emergent stage of the project of building a, a, a platform for data sharing. And uh, because what is at stake is inventing a new public policy concerning the ownership, the uses, the sharing and the exploitation of data at a local scale. And I think it will take a lot of time and we have to be very um, uh, let's say opportunistic about this and uh, 
and uh, leverage on the, the good opportunities that come to build these partnerships and to make something out of them in order to be more intelligent uh, at the, in the future. Is that clear enough, Prune? All right. So, sorry. Uh, so, thanks a lot, Marion. And uh, now, since we are talking about uh, arranging all the stakeholder and exchanging and how to make that like be full of forces, uh, I would like to ask a question for Rinka about the coordination of actor because I think that in Brussels, you're working with several data providers that are not coordinated. So uh, could you share your experience on this point, please, Frank? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Prune. Um, I'm uh, working at the National Mapping Agency and I work with the emergency services in Belgium. And they are very diverse stakeholders who will all have their own uh, important interest which means the firefighters, the police, the emergency, medical emergencies, defense, civil protection, the crisis centers. And they are all king in their own kingdom, but they need to collaborate in times of crisis and that uh, remains uh, quite difficult. They all work in their own silo and within their silo, again, in smaller silos. They are collecting and defining their own data and map information and which means that they uh, do a lot of double work, a bad quality of data, and uh, they, it's also impossible for them to share relevant information quickly uh, because of interoperability issues. Um, and additionally, the data providers, Belgium has been uh, regionalized a lot, so uh, data providers, uh, are spread everywhere at the regional level, local level, national level, and uh, they're also fighting each other sometimes. Um, so there has been a lot of, there have been some visionary emergency workers. They were asking for decades for a good map to start collaborate. And so that's why we started with the program Uniform and Shared Cartography for the Emergency Service. And we were asked because we are, uh, as mapping agency, a neutral actor and stand above the part parties. And the good uh, thing as well is that there is a sense of urgency with uh, climate change, uh, increasing wildfires. Uh, also in Brussels, there are lots of uh, important international events with uh, sometimes 60 heads of state attending a NATO summit. So there's a very demand driven um, projects and uh, we are coordinating this uh, uh, in fact this collaboration of emergency workers and uh, we started with small projects for wildfire and for the nato summit but uh, it, they all demonstrate the power of location and also the part and the power of participation we let our the users uh, in fact participate in the design of the solution and uh, which also means that uh, all different stakeholders need to collaborate and, and be more open. And became Im imminent that an um, umbrella approach is much stronger than arrogant soloist. However, funding is difficult to find as it is, yeah, as it goes above the, uh, above the heads of the individual disciplines. And there's a, uh, uh, we still struggle to find uh, funding to develop a platform for everyone. But uh, on the short time and also on the long run, I think a central catalyst uh, will be and is necessary. So um, I think the incentives is just to, to start with projects and uh, have a, also a strategy and vision for the long run. Let's uh, start and develop with small steps so that your developments are also agile and uh, relatively easily adaptable and everybody still understands what's going on. So this was about what I wanted to tell you. I hope this answers your um, questions.
Yes, of course. Thanks a lot, Frank. Yeah. Uh, I would like now to address the topic of the diversity and the differences between the actor of an ecosystem. And for that, I would ask to, I would, I uh, like to ask, yes, uh, Theopol. Uh, in the smart agriculture ecosystem as orchestrator, how do you achieve to articulate all the diverse actors of your ecosystem that are very different goals, means, objective? Sure. Um, thank you for inviting us. So my name is Theopol. I'm part of the Ag Data Hub team and I'm in charge of uh, product and um, we have a platform, its name is API Agro, and it started in uh, 2014, so six years ago already. <laughs> it was first a research project uh, funded by the Ministry of Agriculture, and um, with, uh, with the goal was to give uh, applied research in agriculture to better exchange data between the different stakeholders. Um, we had a two years, uh, two years project when we spend uh, most of our time doing uh, pedagogy, <laughs> explaining what is data exchange, uh, what are the, the good way, the new technologies with API to exchange data. And um, we spend more time about uh, data governance and pedagogy, saying, okay, you, you keep the use of the data, you stay master of the use of the data, uh, just here to expose and favor discoverability of the data um, and how we can support all the providers in uh, having a, a framework uh, for, for, for the data about legal, business, technical, functional aspects. Uh, so based on this two years project experience, um, we, the, there, is, there was a, a big project named uh, uh, AGGate, uh, with the goal was to define what would be a portal of data for the, for the agricultural sectors. And uh, we support a lot uh, this initiative. And based on uh, of the conclusion of this report, um, the, the main conclusion was uh, it's to the agricultural stakeholders to make their own portal. It's not the government to do so. And um, that's why the whole agricultural sectors uh, gather on the API Agro uh, company and Agdapta company now to gather and define um, a common framework, a common governance, including public actors, private actors, uh, from the fundamental research, applied research, but all the startups ecosystem, also the main uh, software editors, to see how we can decide together about uh, common rules uh, that would be the same for everyone in having a common platform for exchanging data in the agricultural sector. And that's what we have done. Uh, in the six last years, uh, building this common governance and also building, building tools uh, that could support all the digitalization of the agriculture in France. Thanks a lot, Theopold. So uh, that's all for the governance question. And now we will go to the stakeholders' engagement recommendations since we thought in governance issues that stakeholders' engagement is a huge topic. So, because the risk linked to the stakeholder engagement if, is that if you don't have enough stakeholder in your ecosystem, there are not enough data that are traveling, and so you do not have a sustainable ecosystem. So, when we talk about, let's say, uh, the um, critical mass, I just think about the marketplace. So my first question will be for uh, Sean. So Sean, in your marketplace, how do you proceed to engage and motivate all the stakeholders to participate? Uh, 
Uh, Hi, yeah, it's a, it's a really important question. It's a really important part of, of our, of our um, the key work that we're doing right now. Uh, as you as you mentioned already, the you know we, we were operating we were operating a two sided marketplace, which which benefits from from network effects at scale. And if we don't get to that level of scale, um, then we're obviously not going to have a sustainable ecosystem. So the key thing for us is to be able to to grow both sides of this equation at the same time. And obviously, that's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. What we've settled on to start with is that uh, we think that the main thing that we need to focus on is growing our data providers first uh, and our partnerships on the data side first, and then building on top of that the algorithm providers and uh, you know, sort of in a little bit sort of lagging, but also in parallel, um, while at the same time then attracting more and more of the, of the, uh, of the, of the customers. The challenge is, of course, is that uh, when you're talking about engaging with suppliers, uh, obviously what they're wanting to see is a return on putting their data, putting their algorithms on the platform uh, relatively soon. So, you know, what we do is we, in, in terms of engagement and motivation, we have two different mechanisms. Um, but one mechanism is we have a revenue share model in place where we're making sure that for every single usage of, uh, of either a data source or an algorithm, there's a fair revenue share flowing directly to the provider. Uh, and the second thing, of course, when we're, when we're having a, uh, when we're starting from scratch and we're not necessarily having a clear view on how that data source is going to be monetized in the near future, then two things happen. The one thing is we may move more into a reseller model uh, where there's a little bit of an upfront commitment upfront to, to incentivize the data providers to come on board. We also take a lot of the integration efforts of the data source into our platform on board ourselves so that there's no unknown R&D costs from the data provider side. And then the next thing we do is we make sure that we take the responsibility for communicating the value of that data source, the value of that algorithm, the use case that it can solve out into the market so that we're able to help uh, help to attract customers and attract users of that of that data source. Um, and this sort of co-marketing effort that we're doing together with our partners, uh, you know, either for specific verticals or for specific data sources, we're already starting to see that's motivating on both sides of the equation, both on the customer side as well as on the supply side. Thanks a lot, Sean. And uh, now that we are talking about value, I would like to go in the particular focus of always the local ecosystem with a question for Simon. Uh, could you elaborate on how you intend to strengthen the links between the stakeholders of your ecosystem, including cities then that are a huge ecosystem? a huge actor of your ecosystem, please. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for inviting us again. I am uh, Simon Saint-Georges and I am in, uh, in charge of uh, the Ruby project, which is a, a European project uh, where we try to build um, a platform, a portal to share data with um, all stakeholders of the, the city and well, all of the territory. So I think uh, what Sean uh, just said was uh, really a big part of the answer, actually, and it was really interesting. Um, but what what we have been doing, which is probably more specific to our uh, uh, local ecosystem, is some kind of animation and some and some tools and ideas to make um, the ecosystem more alive. And so we, what we try to do, what we have been doing with, uh, with success, and we are, we plan to do again in Rudy, is create events, uh, local events where we we create some time and space for collaboration between the, the stakeholders. So um, this can, this these are uh, dedicated events where we invite all the local stakeholders. So our stakeholders are. Um, they are uh, public public actors, but also private companies, uh, academics, and of course the the word that everyone has <laughs> in their mouth right now is the citizens. And this is a, a dedicated uh, challenge. But uh, we have we have been uh, organizing uh, really interesting events where they all gather uh, during one day, and we we exchange and we have some. Uh, more conference type uh, uh, sessions and more uh, wor other workshops where we work on specific topics that uh, the these stakeholders can have and what we try to do is uh, stimulate the collaboration between them 
And uh, we have been seeing that this works well and this uh, makes it possible for these uh, different stakeholders to meet and, and sometimes uh, un more understand how the others work and what they are expecting. And we think that this uh, will be really um, a, a good, um, yes, we make new, more project possible and more interesting ideas uh, come. And uh, so this is for the, the, yeah, this time and space for collaboration. And what we want to do also is to create tools. And uh, so as, a, as I said, uh, we are working on a platform but we want this platform to be not only a, a technical uh, framework, but also a framework for community and collaboration again. So um, we want to make it possible not only to access and share data, but also to exchange on topics, on projects, and maybe people that can uh, look for new partners or specific skills that are um, needed for the project. And we want all this to, to, to be, uh, to be done uh, in the framework of, of uh, the, the platform that we are creating right now. So it's of course a, a challenge, but this is, this can, we sometimes call, call it um, a data social network. We will see in the future if, it, it's, if it's just a, a catchphrase or if, it's, if it actually works. And um, yeah, there are two, two types of stakeholders that are really a challenge for us. One is the, the data providers and as Sean said, we need to work on uh, the, the value and how we can make them interested in working with us. And that's a, a topic on, on its own. And of course, the citizens that uh, are probably sometimes interested in these topics, but from a, another point of view, and we need to, to make it accessible for them. And so that's what we are working on right now. And this platform and these events should help us to, to, to work on this. Thanks a lot. So to conclude on the stakeholder engagement topic, uh, I would like to give the floor to Dan Isaac from Spire because his experience is kind of a fairy tale, let's say. So uh, Dan, could you please explain us how you took advantage of an important regulation, the regulation about AIS messages in the logistic and tracking ecosystem to build your ecosystem, please. Yes, and again, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this, uh, to this uh, workshop. I'm very, very grateful. So Spire was created um, in 2012 with the idea that, um, that we could use space in order to um, gather valuable information about the world. And in addition to that, we felt that the use of CubeSat technology could, uh, well, small nanosatellite technology could allow, uh, allow us to create value added products at a much lower cost point or price point to the customer than, than, um, than what was being offered in the market up at that date. So we looked at what can be what could be done using a nanosatellite, and nanosatellites are ideally suited for reception of, of passive signals, and uh, obviously the transmission of AIS data is something that can be received passively by a small uh, satellite and processed, and you can extract valuable information from that from that in, from that data. Now, uh, as you well said. Um, the, the International Maritime Organization uh, um, throughout its history has, has tried to create new, new, new ways to improve the safety of vessels at sea. And this is one of the reasons why the AIS protocol uh, was created so that vessels could identify each other as, as they navigate in an automated, in an, as automatic a way as possible. And um, we decided why, why not just receive these messages like, like any other uh, station on, on the ground, but from space, why not receive these messages and see what we can do um, and how we can extract value from that. Um, so we developed the technology and we launched the satellites and now we're gathering uh, data from pretty much the world's uh, fleet um, and processing that data and generating value added products from that. 
Um, now, even though the AIS protocol is, is mandated for vessels of a certain size, um, it was originally conceived to, to, to improve safety and for vessels to kind of share information so that they know that where the, each other is and they don't collide with each other. Um, however, obviously, when the AIS, AIS protocol was created, the, the creators uh, did not really foresee that um, other companies would and would generate value-added products based on that on that data. Um, kind of similar in a way to when GPS was first created. Uh, nobody could imagine that uh, GPS would be used pretty much by anybody in the world in order to generate all kinds of products and services beyond just tracking uh, um, a moving object. So um, now, because the AIS protocol was not created specifically to support these value-added service providers, um, there are certain elements of the data which, which are, which is, let's say, are dirty. Uh, um, you know, the, the vessel, uh, the captains of a vessel, they input data in a certain way, they forget to add certain fields, or, or they use the fields in a, in a way that, that were not supposed to be used. So we, we need to invest a lot of effort to clean that, inf that data, to make sure that that data that, that we receive is actually correct or accurate as possible in, in order to then create the products that we need to then deliver to our customers. So I think there is an important effort from all parts of the, of the value chain to ensure that, that the data that is originated in the first place is as accurate and clean as possible so that all actors in, in, and all stakeholders in the chain can then um, extract maximum value from, from it, whether it's for safety applications or to create uh, value-added products and services at the end of the chain. All right, thank you, Dan. And you helped me to do the switch for the next category, which is technical issue recommendation. Thank you. And the next question is going to be for you again. You're the winner. And it is the next one. Beyond data, what are the components that are needed for a successful ecosystem, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, so again, on the example of AIS, um, okay, our, our satellites also collect all kinds of other data, but I think the example of AIS can match, can be used also for, for the other uh, sources of data. So the data that we, that we collect and we, we, we package and we, we, we clean and we, we prepare, it has no value if it doesn't reach the customer. Um, so in order for that data to reach the customer, we need many, many different elements in the chain, not just on our side, but on other, other parts of, of, of the provider. So we rely very heavily on, on the use of cloud, uh, cloud services. Uh, in order, for, number one, to, to store the data in, in, in a secure manner and, and in a way that can be stored forever, um, in order to process that, that data and generate uh, the right levels of products without having to invest a huge amount of money into creating our own server farms and, 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 and infrastructure. So for us, an important element of the change is, is definitely cloud service providers. Um, you know, the, the usual suspects, of course, um, but they are a, a, a very important part of the overall chain. Not the only part, but a very, very important one. So the ability to use cloud, cloud infrastructure and cloud services to, to, to take that data, make it better, add value, and serve it to our customers is, is definitely an important, uh, an important aspect of the chain. Thanks a lot. Uh, for the next question, I would like to ask Shrem, uh, in Up42, how do you manage to have data available on your marketplace and to make your platform active and usable and used, by the way? Let me skip this. Right. So basically, there are a few elements to this, right? Uh, the first is how we get the data in, uh, how we make sure that it can be used like within our platform uh, and then the last part of it is how we actually deliver that to the customers right um, the first thing is that you know we're, we're not dealing with a single data source and we don't own any of the data uh, and if we think about even just earth observation on its own forget about the rest of geospatial data there are so many different providers 
The archives are growing every single day by huge amounts of data. There is no way that a marketplace or a central point to access this data is able to copy and store a version of this data on, in a sustainable way. It's just not economically feasible. So UP42 operates a very decentralized architecture for the way we access the data. And a fundamental uh, prerequisite for us is that we're, we're able to access the data from our providers via API. And this, this API access to, uh, to the provider's data is what allows us to keep the costs down on our side, but still provide more or less real-time access to the data that's available uh, to our customers. The second, and this is what makes it actionable, right? We don't want to be a marketplace where you can see a list of data sources and you know, push a button to contact sales. We want developers to be able to work with it immediately. Um, this, the same thing applies then for algorithms. And here, you know, um, going back to Dan's comments around standard cloud technology components, we make heavy use of, of things like Kubernetes and Docker to be able to ramp up the algorithms in parallel so that people can do a lot of processing of these algorithms. Again, this makes the data usable, it makes it actionable, it helps people to extract insights. And the final part, of course, is, you know, it's not about the user interface. Of course, the user interface is important to help people learn about the platform and the marketplace and discover what's there. But in order for them to use it at scale, it's everything has got to be accessible and usable via APIs. And again, you'll hear this word APIs come up again and again and again. We are firm believers that APIs are what glue ecosystems together and enable ecosystems. You cannot have a technology driven ecosystems without a solid set of APIs at all connection points. Thank you, Shen. Uh, for this technical aspect, I would like to also give the floor to a customer of one of the ecosystem we have in the study. And so I would like to ask Daniel Sidel from LiveO, how do you find uh, the access to geospatial data mm -hmm. and how do you figure your role within this ecosystem illustrated by up 42 yeah yeah thank you uh, first of all uh, for the invitation and uh, i really enjoyed the discussion you had and uh, sean uh, we are now working together since three years and uh, you, it's uh, you're always reading my mind for us api access is super important because it takes the human out of the equation right um, and as long as you don't have an api access um, you can't build a fully scalable product so for us when we um, um, like founded Lifeo, we don't want to do project-based business. We want to build scalable products. And I was actually um, super surprised uh, that when we then wanted to buy data, that um, the traditional approach in the geospatial industry is that you write an email with um, your request, you put in an AOI, and then humans are taking this AOI, they clip the data for you, and then they ship it to you. And just imagine how much, um, so this is not scalable and this is producing a lot of costs um, and, uh, and is um, taking a lot of resources. So it's impossible with this to, to really build a scalable system. So that's why also for us, um, the APIs are super important because as, as Sean already said, also if you build a nice user interface um, on, on Up42 um, and other platforms, you still have a human there who has to do something. And now imagine you're building a scalable product like we are doing for the infrastructure domain. We want to have thousands of customers with the same product, just in a different geographical region. Um, that's why we have to rely on, on, this, on this success. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, now, uh, since we are on the technological side of the problem, let's say, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about digital transformation and the next question is for Theopol. As the orchestrator of your ecosystem, how does uh, API agro, I said it the wrong way before, so how does API agro perceive the digital transformation triggered by the use of your platform in the agricultural sector. Thank you for, for the question. Um, as it was told, API uh, is core to access data and do automatization. Uh, if you want to favor the data exchange and data spreading, you have to have a API. It's, uh, it's, it's really core that, and that's why it's in our name, API Agro, uh, the, the API of the agronomy sector. 
Uh, so um, when in, uh, at, in the beginning of the project, uh, API was well known in the technical sectors, but not yet uh, in all sector. <laughs> I won't I won't talk for for the others, but uh, it was like uh, you know uh, the beginning. Uh, we have some web services, but it was SOAP services. Uh, we won't we won't go into technical details, but REST API um, are more easier to to consume for someone that discover uh, your data and your services. And uh, when we asked, uh, when when I told we uh, we did like eighteen months of pedagogy, it was okay. Um, what uh, we also made a state of heart about data exchange in the agricultural sectors and main of the exchanges was by uh, files sent by email or FTP or thing like that. Uh, and we have some web services, but very few uh, among the world data exchange. And okay, um, <laughs> the name of the project is API and we have so few in the project. So how we can uh, support them explain how API can help and support them about uh, spreading data inside the company first, and then exchanging with the external co companies, can be partners, can be clients. So we, we did a lot of pedagogy. And um, I think when we are talking about data exchange, it's very hard to find the, the right people because you have, uh, in, for example, for us, uh, if you have a meeting, you have to need some technical guy, uh, the guy from the agronomy also. Um, you have to also have the support of the, um, of the director because when you have data exchange and the world program of, um, of, uh, of the data exchange, uh, API is a strategy you have to, to implement to in, in your company to really transform um, your, your company and how they're working with others or even inside between the different services. And uh, when we are starting this project, it was really how we can uh, foster uh, and support all the ecosystem to leverage uh, about the technical aspect. And we have tools for this, but more and more, we, we had to do a lot of pedagogy. And now we are very happy uh, that the main uh, software editors have got API, um, and we are taking to the next level <laughs> now, but uh, which is how we can check consent. Uh, from the farmers between any data exchange by API. And API will be needed uh, for optimize all of this uh, chain value to see, okay, I've got data, I check the consent, I can access to the consent and I deliver the data. Thanks a lot, Theopold. And since you were talking about consent and we are talking about data, uh, what about talking about the personal data taboo. <laughs> and for that, I will ask Marion from REN. How does REN's intent to leverage the value of personal data uh, through new extraction mechanism and new reuse? And do you think that, do you have a solution to address this topic? Okay, thank you, Prune. Um, well, this is a major issue because we are not dealing with customers and we are dealing with users of public services, but uh, at the top of it, they are citizens. It means that they are political beings, they endorse uh, political responsibility, and in a certain way, they participate in the very definition of the framework in which data, all data, but in particular personal data, can be legitimately used. And um, we are working uh, inside the project, Rudy, we are working on three levers. The first one is to make people understand what it is about. This is a pedagogical program, um, which includes data literacy, meetings, explanations towards different publics. Uh, the second lever is the, the construction, the building of trust uh, around, of course, the data protection, but also the transparency. We plan, for instance, to present to every citizen the total personal data we own about him or her, 
And this is quite a, a huge uh, program and it's uh, really uh, committing. And uh, to build truth, trust, sorry, we also work on the anonymization process with a scientist because in the, in the consortium we have around the building of the platform for data sharing, we have uh, scientists with us and a specialist of this question of anonymization. The third levers we have is to create mechanisms to make it possible for, uh, for uh, individuals to consent to the use of their personal data in good conditions. And um, in, in that uh, perspective, we work with a, a local partner, which is uh, in Rennes, but he, he's part of the Earth Data Hub, which is um, a hub, uh, a consortium for sharing uh, Earth data. And um, this is the, the first part of my answer. This is, uh, we are really, really taking very seriously this aspect of the question. And um, maybe, maybe I hope that I saw there was in the conversation there was a question about that. What do citizens get out the out of this initiative? They, they get transparency, a, a better knowledge of what we, what the, the public actor really has uh, about personal data concerning each of the citizens. And uh, what we hope but maybe it's more a, a hope than uh, anything else. We hope that citizens will agree to share their personal data for reuses for the benefit of projects uh, which are um, in, the, in the general, inter for the general interest. And um, some of our partners, for instance, Enedis or uh, the, the distributor of gas, and this is the national distributor of uh, electricity. We work with them in, inside the consortium uh, building Rudy, but we work also with the national distributor of uh, gas and the Earth Data Hub. These are three partners which I directly uh, already uh, committed in, in projects uh, which are already experiencing and testing this type of solution for consent and reuse of personal data. Um, and uh, just to conclude this point, I would uh, just uh, want to share some idea with you. We speak of data trusts. Uh, we hear a lot of, about data trust and I think uh, this work we are experiencing in that consortium about how we really concretely day to day uh, building the trust uh, maybe uh, just uh, can be labeled as uh, the, the building of a data trust on a local basis and uh, we'll see what the legal form it will take and and uh, this work is uh, just uh, is just done in a collective uh, and very, uh, very inclusive uh, manner. Thank you, Marion. Uh, now, just to conclude the technical recommendation, I would like to uh, talk about architecture. And uh, let's go further with Ren. So, a question for Simon. Uh, Ren has different kind of data and since this different kind of data are reused in your platform, why do you have chosen a federated architecture and why is it particularly relevant in your case, please? Yes, um, thank you. Um, we indeed, we have uh, many different data providers, uh, data pr producers, as we call them. Um, and they are very diversified. We have um, big players, like uh, Marion just said, the national um, institutions that provide uh, data, and we are interested in the, the local part of this, these big uh, data sets. And we also have much smaller um, players, um, NGOs, um, local uh, research labs, and, uh, and very, very di diversified uh, entities. 
And what we need to, to, to do is to find a framework where, where they can all share data um, we, all while um, remaining uh, in control of uh, how it's managed and who has access to, to their data. We think it's very important and we, we think we have a stronger commitment uh, uh, by, by, by these uh, providers when they remain in charge of their data. And we think they will be more willing to join if, they, if this doesn't mean that they lose control. And so this is more, probably more of um, a governance issue than a technical one. And um, also uh, another thing is that we, out, outside of that, we don't want to centralize the data in one place for also other reasons. And one of them being uh, not duplicating, uh, replicating data um, for, um, environmental reason, what, that's one reason, but also because uh, um, getting the data from the source is always the fresh, the fresher source, and uh, we, we just, you just need to, you, you have the, the best data when you get it directly from um, from the, the the providers system. So, a federated uh, architecture allows us to build a more interesting and more complete. A governance framework actually we, now we can start uh, uh, working on the rules uh, what does it imply when you become a data provider that's connected to the federation uh, what are your your rights and your obligations and everything and it's uh, a better better framework for discussion when you don't have to to take the take, take control over um, the, the systems of the providers i hope that uh, that's clear Yes, very clear. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and uh, let's have another point of view. So, Sean, could you ask, explain us uh, why, uh, how you did choose your uh, architecture model for a forty two? All right. So, um, yeah, for us, it's, it's pretty much, you know, I think similar drivers that Simon was just explaining. Um, you know, it's really important for partners to feel comfortable that you're going to be looking after their products, that you're not, not only technically, but also from a commercial perspective. You know, I think a big problem in, in, in the geospatial and in, in Earth observation in particular is that there are a lot of use case restrictions and a lot of, um, uh, fears that that if you lose control of your data product, then you're going to lose revenue streams and other channels. So a lot of our um, architecture was driven by feedback from partners on what would make them comfortable to bring their products into our marketplace. Uh, so that was on the one side. The second part of it was, as we already spoke about earlier, we needed two things to happen. We needed to be able to bring in data from lots of different providers at the same time without necessarily copying any of the data. And of course, our data architecture really drove uh, was driven from that decision. Uh, and then the second part was in terms of how we're dealing with algorithms, et cetera, uh, was really about, okay, how can we scale up to be able to do lots of processing in parallel, uh, which, which led us to a uh, Kubernetes and Docker driven architecture for, the, for the, the, the processing side. What's really important here as well is that, you know, when you're, when you're taking a, a, an architectural model, which, which relies on you bringing the data into your system or close to your system, what you don't want to necessarily do is, uh, um, is, is copy too much data. You know, there's a lot of expense in moving data from one cloud provider to another cloud provider, especially when you're crossing uh, regions, et cetera. So our overall architecture allows us to, um, over time, more and more start ramping up the processing work where the data already resides. Uh, and this is also a very big benefit from a, from a latency and cost efficiency perspective. Thank you, Sean. And now we are uh, at the last part of my questions. And uh, let's address the topic of uh, economic sustainability to finish. Uh, for each panelist, I will have just one question. Uh, what are the main best practices of your ecosystem that ensure the anti-fragility of your ecosystem? 
And first, uh, Marion, can you tell us something about that? Yes, this is a very tough question. Uh, if we had the solution, maybe uh, everybody around this table would be very happy. Uh, the thing that I can say is that we're really working on that. Um, and um, it is really part of our attempt to understand uh, the the old governance of uh, such a, a shared, uh, data sharing platform. And um, well, this something which is very important, and, and I think the the exchanges we we had today is really highlighting this, is that. Um, we can see that the the question of uh, uh, govern uh, uh, data sharing or uh, the the uses of data for the uh, most wide publics is a uh, is a technical process, but it's it's also a governance process. And uh, in our project Rudy, we really enter the we we try to address both these questions in a very integrated way. And uh, for instance, we well we have a, a, a whole work package on governance, and uh, it means uh, what are the rules. I was very much interested in what they both said about the time they spent on defining common rules for data sharing in the agricultural field, and this is quite the same problem for us. We have really to to we we. We really have to spend a lot of time on these governance aspects, but we link very tightly the the economical aspects to this decisional aspect of what are the rules we give us to share the data of a local territory like uh, Rennes Metropole. And um, what we the the hypothesis we made is that. Uh, uh, if we want to imply all sorts of publics, all sorts of stakeholders in the governance of a platform for sharing data, uh, we have to imply them also on an economical basis. And there are a lot of questions around this. The only thing I can say, we have no solution, but we have pointed that problem as a major, major aspect of our project and we are working on it very concretely uh, with the data holders, with the producers, with the data, data users, with the citizens and uh, inside the, the governance of, of the local actor that is Rennes Metropole. And uh, well, this is a long path to go. I'm just not sure that we'll have operational solutions replicable for everybody at the end of the process in three years. But I hope we'll, ha we'll, we'll have in that time enlightened a little bit this question and we'll have more clear um, solutions to test. And um, maybe not, not, um, not all made solutions, but maybe identified also the, the 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 false good ideas that we should have uh, uh, elaborated in the first way we want really to test what is possible what is acceptable for all the stakeholders around the table but i'm i think i said that previously but i really think that we are going to to end with the idea that it is um not the only responsibility of the public actor, but uh, that everybody is is uh, hoping that the public actor will take his part in a legal way in the responsibility aspect of this question, but also in the economical aspect of this question. So let's see. And we, we will really uh, be happy to share the results of this project on this point, which is the governance point. Uh, and especially the economical aspect of this question. Thank you, Marion. Uh, so same question for uh, Dan, and perhaps you already told that, but we thought it was a really good practice. So which technological choice are your main sustainability assets in the logistic and tracking ecosystem, Dan? Yes. You can still hear me, yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, so 
let, let, let's work backwards from our customers. So our, our customers are in the maritime industry. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm sticking to the AIS, um, to the AIS example. Uh, so our customers in the maritime industry, this is a very cost conscious in, industry. They want valuable data at the lowest possible cost point. So we, we and the rest of the chain working backwards, we, we need to be able to deliver that, that data at the lowest possible uh, price point and of course cost point to us. So for us, obviously being a, let's call it a space-based company, um, one of the most important factors in, 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 in bringing down the cost of our operations is of course the use of, of the CubeSat technology, the nanosatellite technology. Uh, it, it allows us to launch uh, sensors into space. The sensors are, of course, the ones that actually generate the revenue, let's put it that way. But it allows us to launch sensors into space at, at, a, at a cost point that is orders of magnitude lower than, um, than let's call it, a traditional spacecraft, um, which then allows us to, to uh, obviously uh, put more effort into, into the the amount of money that goes into cloud-based services, generating the, the right APIs for our customers, um, improving the, the quality of the, the data rather than putting all that money into a large spacecraft. Um, so obviously the CubeSat or nanosatellite platform is, is an important technological element to ensure that we deliver to our customers um, the best data at the lowest possible uh, 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 price point. Um, and, and as I said before as well, another of, of important technology is the use of, 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 of cloud services. And as some of my other colleagues have, have already said, the, the, also the ability to deliver that data using, using API. So we take away the, 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 the human in the middle uh, and therefore reduce also the, the, those cost elements. So I would say those nano satellite technology, um, which by the way, also reduces the price of launching the, those, those satellites into space. So nano satellite technology, uh, cloud-based service, cloud technology, and API technology, that, those are fundamental elements to ensuring that we uh, serve our customers at, at a price point that they're able to say, okay, bring it on. <laughs> Give me some of that. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Uh, so I will ask always the same question to Shen. What are the key factor, let's say, for a party to sustainability? So I think on the one side, uh, the, the, the key factor for us is being able to form long lasting partnerships with, with our suppliers, um, both on the data provider side and the algorithm uh, side. Um, of course, it takes a long time for, for us to build up a, uh, an ecosystem of users, right? And, and of course, we need to have the data providers and the algorithm providers on board long enough and have patience while we're busy building this up uh, over time for it to be be sustainable. So I think this is the this is the one thing. I think you know ecosystems take time. Um, the return on investment doesn't come immediately, and I think this is just something that that uh, that needs to that needs to be uh, more or less accepted. Um, the other key thing for us is that, of course, in in the Earth observation industry in particular, uh, there is a lot of new data sources uh, coming online in the next couple of years. Huge numbers of, of constellations and satellite launches. Um, and of course, if we're able to get access to these data sources via API, via good data platforms, uh, then we can obviously help to build our ecosystem faster and, and, and make it more sustainable. Um, and the final thing is, and, and this is a real key one, uh, you know, we have to make sure that we don't breach the trust of our data providers. Uh, we, we try to do this by being as transparent as possible about where we are, uh, by providing real-time access to reports which show how, they, how the, the products are being used of our partners in, in more or less real time, but at the same time, um, recognizing the, the privacy of our customers and making sure that the data is, is segregated and, and anonymized enough um, so that we're not leaking any customer information or, or providing sort of um, you know, competitors with potential information about each other that would, that would you know, give them an unfair advantage. So we've got to be transparent, but we've also got to be careful around uh, you know, uh, security of data. Thank you very much, Sean. And uh, now it's time for Theopol to explain uh, us the key success factor for the sustainability of API Agro and Data Hub. Uh, 
Your phone, please. Yes. Um, a lot has been said already. Uh, I think when you are talking about ecosystems, you have to have both providers and users. Um, on the API Agro platform, uh, now we have something like 1,000 users. So the so most issue or main issue is rather to to have providers um, to make them accept to share the data in this common framework with uh, all the guidelines that have been promoted uh, for in the ecosystems with uh, everyone. Um, yeah, the goal of the platform also, I think uh, what we build, it's really a vertical platform. So um, this study was about geographical data. Uh, we have some in our platform, not only, but, uh, but we have some. And uh, people expect uh, to find every data about agriculture on our platform. And that's why we have also open to open data to commercial data. You can find all type of data on our platform. And I think this is something that uh, users uh, expect uh, when they come to our platforms, really, is to find all the data they need in the ecosystem. That's why also we support them. Like uh, if you don't find the data you need, just uh, give us uh, an email and we will uh, look for you the right providers to onboard them on the platform and allow you to access the data you need to develop your services. I think this is something important. We, 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 talk, we talk a lot about pedagogy, but it's also about supporting the ecosystem with services. Uh, they may need about where can I find the right data? Uh, how can you bring the right provider for me? Um, we also, something we, we have not talked about a lot, it's about standardization of the data. Um, I think, for example, with uh, App42, uh, they standardize the way to access to the data for all their providers. Say, so, okay, we allow you to access for us to all the data, and they have standardized how to access to the data. This is something important, but also how we, the, when you are talking about the same kind of data, for example, in agriculture, when you are talking about plots, uh, when you are talking about herd, about making performance, you have to have uh, standardization, you have standards to allow to access in the same way to the data um, to any providers. And I think this is something important and see some challenges uh, we are facing in, in our ecosystem, for example. Something important also, it's about the trust. Uh, it has been told, if you have no trust in the, in, in the system, in the value chain, uh, you don't have any data exchange. Because if the providers don't trust the data, your, your, your system and your tools to secure the data exchange, it, it won't come on the platform to expose. And if your users don't trust your providers, for example, um, they won't use your platform because they don't uh, they don't see the value of the data. They think the data has no value if they don't have trust in the data. And um, I think this is uh, all we are working of the strategies we are working on to to develop a sustainability platform and sustainability tools. Um, so the last thing was about the consent of the farmers. Um, farmers' data are uh, uh, considered uh, highly uh, with high privacy. Uh, same for medical data. Uh, we, we do a lot of uh, comparison with medical data in agricultural sectors. And we're working a lot about the consent uh, of the of the farm of the farms, which are not personal data, but uh, company data. Uh, so we're not talking about GDPR, but uh, we're talking about what are the common frameworks that the world sector have to have to establish to to get this trust. Thank you, Theopold. Uh, now, Rink, do you have any best practice to share with us to conclude on your part? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, thank you. Um, in fact, uh, the economic system sustainability, uh, well, the emergency services uh, are often not paid for their um, services, but uh, the prices, of course, the money is gained uh, for the damage that is avoided. But uh, the, the sustainability of 
the ecosystem lies within the uh, the uh, the use the the thing the amount of time and lives and and uh, damage they save uh, with by participating in the ecosystem and um, it's also about trust but um, they need to gain something i mean they also say sometimes uh, if the system is not really addressing our daily issues then we are not going to uh, use the system so the system is not going to, doesn't have to be um, some kind of theoretically developed system but needs to be a practical one um, the this is in, in fact the most important message and that makes uh, all stakeholders uh, collaborate both the users and the data providers because i have also learned that the data providers become very enthusiastic by participating in an ecosystem because they know okay how is my data used and how can i improve the data that they provide and they even start uh, providing new data so this is a win-win situation for both sides of the in the ecosystem, the providers and the eaters of the of the food uh, in the ecosystem. So I think this is um, also some some good issue from the biological point of view of ecosystems. Yes, thank you, Rink. And now to conclude this panel, I would like to ask the same question again and again to Daniel. So Daniel, what are the success factor, let's say? Yeah, I mean, we already hear it a lot, um, but I want to um, try to give a different perspective here. For me, sustainability means that we trans, um, uh, transfer from um, artificial demand to real demand of the industry. If you look into the geospatial industry, it's heavily driven by governmental contracts um, and by research. And we have to change this. I, I haven't seen any great B2C Earth observation application so far. Just think about this. There is no really application which everyone is using outside, uh, which is um, um, which is based on classifications of satellite images, um, except uh, the typical map services, right? Um, and this is caused, I think, by um, the um, data access. We talked a lot about this today, like the APIs, because what does it mean actually um, uh, to create um, uh, the real demand? You need scalable products. Uh, we had the fact already that uh, you, you need to um, uh, build products which, which can scale uh, without uh, humans in the equation because this is slowing down um, uh, the speed and is in increasing the cost. And I think um, we have to stimulate um, like the uh, like technical solutions uh, to enable this um, regarding the excess. Um, then with the automatization, prices will drop for products and then more people can benefit actually from geospatial products. And we fear the citizens, right? But um, uh, for them, just imagine they want to monitor their garden. Um, it's it's impossible um, if you if you have um, if you don't have a very minimal transaction size. Um, then the the second thing what I want to say is that we are um, I think in the next two years we are we are progressing that satellite data um, and satellite imagery is um, um, like becoming a commodity, and I think that uh, through platforms such as Up42. Um, also, um, the basic analytics, image classification is going to be a commodity in around five years from now on. But now again, think from the user perspective. The classification on a satellite imagery is still not a product. It's just a, it's just a step in the entire value chain to deliver a product. And um, to build those products, there are a lot of, lot of more steps um, and um, we have to take. So I think, um, and this is also not how we are using Up42, we, we, are, we are using it for data access so far because this is the biggest challenge right now. But we see also that um, if there would be, for example, a better um, tree detection algorithm than our own algorithms, we would utilize this because then we don't have to, to spend the resources. So just imagine an ecosystem um, with, um, where we solve the data access, where we have um, um, a lot of companies um, competing for the best algorithms for de detecting cars, detecting trees, then the real product development starts. And then with those products, we will create a real demand. And then we have a sustainable ecosystem. And I think we're going to reach that in the next 10 years. I hope you are right. So thanks a lot. It's the end of this panel. I would like to thank a lot my panelists. Thanks. And now I will give the floor to Sebastian. 
uh, you will elaborate on the recommendation that you didn't illustrate, but you already illustrated a lot of them, so thank you. And uh, so now is Sebastian. So as we are... Uh, Okay. Another try? Yeah. Okay, it should work. <laughs> yes. Hello. Um, our purpose in a few minutes is to bring a more uh, transversal insights about uh, the implication in, for uh, spatial data infrastructures. So, our uh, first remark is about the vision of the ecosystem brought by our, our methodology. And uh, to answer a question that we saw on the chat, uh, the first idea is to have a tool, a modeling tool, that is able to, um, be, uh, to be used later on by uh, SDI uh, managers or uh, workers to, uh, to be appropriated then and uh, used to model their own ecosystem. Concerning the, the main question, it is the role actually of uh, a SDI uh, pertaining to the orchestration of an ecosystem. So the first uh, and the most important is uh, the role of standardization, which for most of the aspects is run for uh, now a long time. We have a large body of research. What, uh, what is brought by our study is the importance of uh, standardization of personal data that are uh, uh, based on, uh, uh, for example, GDPR and uh, consent modules. Um, and also to, um, to make, um, how do you say, um, to cover also the uh, company's data that can be uh, released through uh, private data uh, release. And actually, the same stands for crowdsourcing uh, or volunteer geographic information. So the question for SDI there is how they may contribute to make uh, this uh, data collection sustainable. And there we had uh, an example from another ecosystem. We, we did not uh, study in this, but uh, uh, it uh, brought interesting insights. It's about the weather data ecosystem in the United States. And the National uh, Meteorological Agency uh, created uh, an application to supervise and uh, the data collection from uh, citizens. So and what is interesting is it can be done this way in a professional way. This data may be compared later on with uh, what we call offer well, authoritative, authoritative data. And uh, also, uh, it is showing that uh, public good is a driver sufficient enough to uh, uh, ensure the sustainability of uh, data collection for crowdsourcing. And uh, in our index ca uh, cases, you have the case of Rudy also, which is kind of um, based on the same ID. Again, you have the case of uh, data cooperatives, which can be understood as a crossroad, at the crossroad between personal data and crowdsourced data. Uh, and then again, SDIs have to position themselves whether either to integrate uh, some features of uh, data cooperative to influence and to advise the development of uh, uh, these co cooperatives and also to reuse their hot codes. So there we have another example from an ecosystem uh, about healthcare with an application named My, My Data. So I cannot elaborate too much, but you can easily find it in the uh, uh, internet. Um, so to summarize this, uh, SDI needs to foster the standardization of special data uh, across the data lifecycle, not only uh, the initial uh, data collection, to encourage the adaptation, adoption sorry, of standards uh, for new kinds of data, especially in the uh, personal data. And, uh, to, uh, and this is linked actually to the data literacy issue because uh, they have a huge role of orchestration to, uh, to uh, spread the knowledge in the ecosystem. 
A more general question is uh, how the roles uh, may be shared between st stakeholders concerning data production. So you have actually a kind of tension in the European Union model between uh, open data, uh, let's say open data, open access, shared data models, which can at the same time stimulate uh, an ecosystem, a data ecosystem, and represent, uh, depending on the perspective uh, and the context, uh, a kind of uh, uh, endurance in, uh, to hinder the development of uh, commercial offers. So it's always very case specific, uh, technology specific. Uh, then we have uh, a remark about the incentives to release the data by private actors. Uh, we have uh, already mentioned several times the GDPR mechanism, so I don't insist on that, but you had also some thoughts uh, about uh, uh, private, uh, to say, data having a, a public value, but privately held, and uh, it, it occurred also during the discussion about the high value data set. And what our uh, use cases are showing is also the strong uh, incentive that represents uh, a business perspective uh, and profitable business perspective, at least so for the data that are commercially distributed. Again, we, sh we should insist more about on the uh, data, um, uh, on the knowledge, uh, sorry, exchanges in the ecosystem. So we will just highlight, uh, as mentioned by uh, Mrs. Glat Glatron, the data literacy, which uh, actually is aiming at uh, uh, aligning the, the cognitive the representation of the ecosystem, but also uh, the knowledge about the standards, the data models, the outputs of the ecosystem. And uh, it is also envisioned in the European data strategy that uh, uh, Mr. Kotsev will mention in a few moments. And to conclude and to elaborate on the remark made by, by uh, Mr. Asbrook, uh, you have the deep meaning of uh, what means of orchestrating for a data ecosystem. So we have to know that uh, data uh, orchestration was designed for very uh, specific uh, platforms such as uh, Apple, if, uh, Google, or uh, industries such as uh, uh, computers uh, like uh, IBM, uh, models. For, um, for the data ecosystem, what is important is not the idea of governing an ecosystem, but influencing an ecosystem and uh, orienting it in a, a sustainable uh, direction. And as uh, there are a lot of uh, actors uh, that are not all uh, well integrated, we, we suggest the concept of a distributed orchestration which means this orchestration function will be shared uh, by different stakeholders across the ecosystem. So for the uh, SDI, it will be more about the data provision, but it should know, of course, the downstream activities. So this perspective of uh, distribu distributed uh, orchestration is also meaning that these actors have to be uh, aware first of their role in the ecosystem. And uh, also that this kind of orchestration is more subtle uh, maybe more balanced than in a, uh, uh, say, manufacturing ecosystem, but it's also actually even more complex uh, to, to implement, of course. Thank you. Alex, please. Yes, th thanks, uh, colleagues. It is my turn uh, now very, very quickly. First of all, I would like to once again thank all, all the panelists for the outstanding uh, uh, work. This, this was really insightful and uh, so, so many uh, good examples, so much food for uh, thought, which, which I think also confirms the overall approach that we undertook together with colleagues from LIST to really zoom into to, to real work, working examples of uh, uh, mature and sustainable ecosystems so that we can learn uh, from that. To all of our um, attendees today, you, you, you saw the recommendations, they were shared already to get with you, but uh, um, you will also receive uh, a little bit more uh, substance in the deliverable that actually talks about, uh, gives a more comprehensive overview of the different recommendations. 
argues what are the uh, outstanding barriers and then also uh, makes a link to the uh, actual good practices, a lot of which we already heard uh, together today. I would like to conclude uh, by mentioning that uh, uh, actually now it would be the moment to really think of the uptake of those kind of uh, recommendations. So we need to move on from the linear approach in which spatial data infrastructures were conceptualized many years ago to this uh, more agile, more flexible manner that many of our distinguished panelists uh, mentioned uh, today. We need to also, I think, uh, uh, make sure that all the actors uh, participate in the process to have an inclusive process, because if we don't really include them, then uh, uh, we, we, the, the whole initiative is not uh, going to be uh, sustainable. We need to educate clearly uh, uh, external stakeholders users quite often do not uh, know uh, what uh, they, how to use the data we need to build trust i think i heard a lot uh, from, from many of you about the trust which we, we need to be working on then um, uh, uh, on the technical uh, side of uh, things, we heard APIs, 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 standards, but also I really uh, liked the, 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 what Dan and to an extent Sean also mentioned that data has no value if it does not actually reach the user. We can do whatever fancy technical solution, architecture, etc., but it makes very little sense if we don't uh, do that. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, from uh, Theo, real demand. Yes, this is what it's all about. Uh, if we have a project uh, uh, which uh, by definition is a time boxed activity, everything works. We need to mo move on beyond that and we need to work on, on, on the real demand. And I think we have a real demand uh, on, on multiple levels. Uh, look at what the slide uh, now, now, now mentions. I don't want to go into the detail, but uh, this, what we're discussing today, is so close to the heart of the on the political agenda of, of the Commission, and we have all of those initiatives: the European Strategy for Data, White Paper on AI, the Open Data Directive, support through the Digital uh, Europe Program, establishment of sector-specific data spaces, one on on the Green Deal, but also uh, others that are uh, sector-specific. So the political context is there, but clearly, I think, as was mentioned today alone no no single uh, stakeholder or user can achieve too much so we are in the same boat uh, together users uh, providers the national level also the uh, european level and with that i think uh, i would like to stop uh, because we are uh, out of time uh, but thanks again to all for the lively discussion and uh, for for the outstanding work last but not least thanks to the colleagues uh, from list for uh, the a really remarkable job that uh, they have uh, done.